time, and I was very proud of myself for starting the movies right on time. In fact, <laughs> this is how precise I was. Uh, when you've got, we had these automated systems, so most of what was going on there, I didn't have to uh, be standing right there next to the, the projector while it was running. I really just had to worry about maintenance, cleaning, and just threading up the projector each time a new show was going to begin. And so uh, then once the projector's ready to roll, it just sits there, you know, the film all threaded up, and then you, you just have to push a start button. Everything from that point is automated. It starts the motor, it strikes the lamp, it turns on the sound system, it dims the lights in the auditorium. All these things happen in sequence, and then finally your first frame of film is on the screen. And I knew that uh, the time between my pushing the start button and that first frame of film appearing on screen was eight seconds. So you can imagine, <laughs> if we had a movie scheduled to start at eight o'clock, I would go up there, stand next to the projector, and at eight seconds before eight o'clock, I would push the start button, and that movie would come on screen at exactly eight o'clock. I don't know if anybody ever uh, realized I was doing this as far as our, our customers realizing it. But I figured, you know, there were some military installations around. I figured maybe there's some people in the military that uh, in the course of their military operations have synchronized their watches to the Naval Observatory clock or something like that. And so there must be someone in the audience at some point who's able to recognize when they see the lights start to dim that, wow, that guy just started the movie at exactly 8 o'clock, you know. Chances are nobody really took note of my extreme precision there, but I was always proud of myself for starting the movies on time. So uh, anyway, I want to skip ahead then to the 1990s, and uh, I was becoming a clock collector. I had a lot of interesting clocks that I liked, but one thing that always uh, bothered me was that I didn't have a clock that was perfectly accurate. So I was always having to just adjust my clocks here and there, and, you know, daylight saving time was a big deal because I'd have to change the time on, you know, dozens of clocks that I had in my collection. I remember going to a clock shop uh, and asking uh, somebody there, you know, is there such a thing as a clock that can set itself using these, these atomic clock broadcasts? And they actually had one. It was a clock that was made more for industrial purposes because there are clock systems that they might use in factories or schools, universities, whatever, where you've got one master clock and then every other clock in the building and throughout the different rooms of the building or uh, around the campus or whatever, those clocks are all wired in to the master clock. And then all of those clocks throughout the, uh, throughout the building or the complex uh, display the same time as the master clock. And they had something like this at this one clock store uh, that could set itself by receiving the radio signal from uh, the WWV broadcast. And... I thought, oh, that's a great clock. Can I get one of those? He said, well, you know, they're actually made for industrial purposes. They're very expensive. They're really not practical for what you want. And I, I said, well, that's too bad. And he did assure me, though. He said, I've, you know, I've been to the, the conventions, and I'm f familiar with what the industry is doing in the whole clock-making industry. And, and he said, just there, there are some people working on this, so just be patient. There will be a clock soon that will um, be available on a more affordable consumer level that'll be able to set itself to the atomic clock. So just be patient. And so the day finally came in 1995, where just out of the blue, I got this uh, catalog in the mail, gadget catalog, that I don't even know how I got on their mailing list, but I was glad I was, because out of the blue, I get a catalog from a company called Lifestyle Fascination. They've since gone out of business but they have um, all kinds of little gadgets in this in this catalog, and and right in the middle there there was this Yunkan's Mega Clock. It was a clock that could set itself according to the atomic clock in Colorado. And I realized well, this is it. Finally, after all my waiting, I've got a chance to buy this clock that can set itself and remain accurate using the uh, atomic clock standard. Uh, it was about $200 in this catalog, just a little clock that sits on your mantle that's, uh, you know, maybe eight or nine inches tall, 
And I thought, well, that's kind of an expensive clock, of course, but uh, how could I resist? So that was it. In late 1995, that's when I bought my first what we call radio-controlled clock, uh, which could set itself. And, and another neat thing about it was that it would make the change for daylight saving time by itself. So that was fun. You could just, you know, just leave it running. And until the battery wears out, you never have to adjust it at all. You've got a clock that's showing you the correct time right down to the second. So that is a, a not-so-brief summary of my interest in the subject of atomic timekeeping. And I'll have more to say about the technology and about the products and less to say about myself in upcoming podcasts. So I just want to thank you again for giving me a moment of your time to enjoy the Atomic Timekeeping podcast. I hope you'll join me again next time when I'm going to talk about the technology that makes the real atomic clock work. And, uh, well, that'll be fun for the next Atomic Time podcast. Uh, also, if you have any comments or feedback, I will accept your email. The address is atomicelmer at gmail.com. Okay? Atomicelmer at gmail.com. Dot com. I'll be happy to entertain your thoughts there. Uh, I may even quote your email on an upcoming podcast, so let me know whether or not you'd like me to do that. Uh, if you want to just tell me your name and where you're from, that might make it fun if I quote your email in an upcoming podcast. So again, thanks, and we'll see you next time on the Atomic Timekeeping Podcast.